continuing our series through the Psalms of Ascents, Psalms that the uh, pilgrims making their way to Jerusalem where the great feast would sing on their way up there to prepare their hearts and their minds for worship. I want to begin this morning. You know, dreams are kind of a weird thing. I woke up the other morning. I had had this really wild, strange dream. And all I remember was being upset when I woke up because I had upset Dory somehow. And I told Dory all about the dream. I remember every single detail of it. And today I cannot remember one detail about the dream. Isn't it weird how dreams are like that? You ever had a dream and you wake up and you remember the dream and then you try to think of it and it goes away as quickly as you're trying to think? Any of you had that problem? Uh, dreams are weird like that. There's one dream I've never had, but I've heard of people that have had it, so evidently it's a fairly common dream. It's the one where you show up at school or at work and you don't have your pants on. Did anybody ever had that dream? Raise your hand if you ever had it. It must be me. Okay, a couple of you have. All right. Or another version is you get there and you realize you're naked. Have any of you ever had that dream? Would any of you admit it if you had? So. Well, I want you to, to imagine a dream. Now, I, I would normally say close your eyes and imagine this, but, it, but if you do that, we may have to wake some of you up afterwards. I, and I, not that it's not going to be entertaining this morning, I just know you too well. But I want you to imagine this dream. And in this dream, you find yourself standing at two great gates. They're huge. In fact, as you're standing there, you can't see the tops and you can't see the sides. I mean, these are just massive, massive gates. And you're standing there at these gates and they begin to open. And you can see a little sliver down and you realize this is a great big hallway. Just very, very long. And at the end of it, up on this elevated platform is a throne. And even though you've never seen him, you know that on that throne is God. And, in, and you, you're kind of overcome by this sense of anticipation and a little bit of apprehension. But at the same time, you're thinking to yourself, I get to go, I get to go see God. That's pretty awesome. And so someone appears next to you and tells you, go in. He wants you to go and stand before him. And so you walk through the gates, and just as you get inside the, the great doors or the great gates, you notice there's a full-length mirror there. And of course, you're going to stand before God, and so you've got to check and make sure that every hair is in place, right? You've got to check, make sure you don't have any lettuce stuck in your teeth or anything. I've got to tell you guys this story. We went to Harris Pizza the other night. Uh, took Dory's mom there. She was in the mood for pizza. And Dory ordered a spinach. And what else did you have on it? Spinach and tomatoes and something. And they put all this cooked, uh, shredded spinach all over the top of it. And so we're eating. And, and uh, just as we're getting ready to leave, Dory turns around and says, Do I have spinach? Do I have tea? And they were just filled with spinach. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was funny. Uh, she took care of it anyway. But, you know, but we want to check those kind of things before we go and stand before God, right? You know, make sure that your shirt is tucked in correctly if you were tuck your shirt. And make sure your skirt's straight. You know, all those kind of things that you, you want to make sure you look good because you're going to stand before God. So you walk up and you look in the mirror. When you turn around and you look at it, you're just all of a sudden panicked. Because even though you know you're wearing clothes, it's not one of those dreams, but you realize that you're covered with something. And it's shaggy, and it's dirty looking. And you notice that it's all these little pieces of like paper or parchment or something. And it's not just like one layer that covers you, but I mean, it's just piles upon piles upon piles and layers and stacks of it just all over you. You look like a bowling ball with just little slits open in it for your eyes that you can see. And you're thinking, what on earth is this? And so you kind of hold an arm up and you pull out one of those little pieces of paper there and you look at it. It's got writing on it and you read it and you're just like, oh no. 
you look at another one, and your heart just kind of gets this funny feeling in it, like you're about to be sick. Did you realize that on each of those little pieces of paper is a record of your sin? Every single sin that you've ever committed is recorded in very vivid detail. From that quarter you stole off your dad's dresser as a kid to get an ice cream to that time you lied about your homework and the dog really didn't eat it. Every lustful thought you've ever, ever had. Every misspoken word that ever came out of your mouth is recorded. Every angry thought you ever had towards someone Every bit of wickedness, greed, selfishness, it's all recorded. And so you, you start trying to pull it off because, I mean, you're supposed to go and stand before God. And, and so you're trying as hard as you can to pull this stuff off, but it won't come off. And you're left with that sense of how can I go and stand before the one who can read every one of these. That holy God who is so holy he can't even stand in the presence of God. And so you're overcome with this sense of darkness. And I want you to really let that sink in. I could stand up here all day listing sins, but I don't know your sins. But you do. And I want you to let those kind of sit there and let those kind of build a little bit because that right that is where Psalm 130 begins. Psalm 130 begins in the first line and he says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. I was reading several commentaries that, this week and they all said, you know, this is one of those psalms that that relates to everyone because we, we all know the depths of despair. And if you've never been in the depths of despair, you will be. And so this psalm speaks to everyone, but I think it's not just the depths of despair. Because in, in Hebrew, the word depths, or actually more literally the deep, I call out to you from the deep. That word deep, has a, it's kind of a loaded term in Hebrew. It, it, it means, it refers back in the Hebrew mindset to that point in time, that place in time where God and His creation have not yet met. There's a separation there. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This in the Bible is that moment just before God speaks and interacts with His creative process. This is that moment when there's still a distance and a separation between God and what God is doing. And in that separation is the deep and the darkness. The psalmist cries out from that place. And then we're going to see, spoiler alert, but in verse 3 we're going to see that what's separating the psalmist from God is his own personal sin. And so out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. And this is, this is not just one of those psalms that somebody's just thinking it. This is, a, this is literally a cry. It's a vocalized prayer and crying out to God. And we get that in verse 2 where he says, O Lord, hear my voice. He wants God to hear this. He's voicing this prayer. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. And we need to really wrap our brains around what he's asking for. Mercy. Because again, covered in this sin, every sin you've ever committed, of coming before the God who is holy and who is righteous and knowing that there's nothing that you can do to pull these things off of you, nothing you can do to make yourself clean and right and, and okay to stand before Him. The only thing that you can do 
is to ask for His mercy. All of that sin that's piled up on you, that you've committed over and over again throughout the years, that separates you from God, in all honesty, that sin deserves for you to stay separated from God forever. And there's nothing you can do that makes you worthy to stand before Him sinless. You're just filthy. And all you can do is say, have mercy on me. And that is where the, the psalmist comes in verse 3, or in verse 2. And we realize that the reason the psalmist is where he is is because of his own sin. And that sin has kept him separated from God. In verse 3, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? The first three verses of this psalm bring us to just absolute depths of despair. And then it turns. Because beginning in verse 4, we see something that begins to shed light. See, the reason that the psalmist can lay there before God and put himself at the mercy of God is because he knows what we learn in verse 4. He's, in verse 4 it says, But with you there is the forgiveness. And therefore you are feared. NIV doesn't translate the definite article there. It says, it says, with you, Lord, is forgiveness. But there's more to it than that. Literally, it says, with you, Lord, is the forgiveness. And I think we need to understand that because really, the only one who can forgive us of our sin is the Lord. And that's the forgiveness that we need. I mean, I can sin, I can do something that's wrong, and I can go to Dory and she can say, it's okay, I forgive you. Give me a neck rub and we'll, we'll call it even. But that doesn't work for God. And that doesn't work with my standing before God. The only forgiveness that does any good is the forgiveness. And the psalmist knows that God has that. The psalmist knows that that is what God desires more than anything else is to forgive. And he goes on and he says, And therefore, since you have the forgiveness, you are to be feared. I think the word feared here has a lot to do with obedience and honor and love, as well as the fact that not only can he give the forgiveness, but he can also withhold it. But there's more to that. He's approaching God because he knows that God has the forgiveness and the fear that he has is a laying in the presence of God. But again, we understand that all we can do with our sin-covered self is to throw ourselves on God's mercy and just wait. And that's what we get to picking up in verse 5 and 6. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. He says it twice because he wants to emphasize that. You know, we live in a world where we like everything to happen quick for us, right? But in God's realm, there's this waiting. We trust. And we wait. There's, a, there's a, such a deep expression of trust in here. Because he says that in his word, I put my hope. He's not just throwing himself at the mercy of some foreign and unknown God that he has no idea if God's going to do anything or not. But he's throwing himself at the mercy and crying out for mercy for a God that he knows because God's word has told him about this God. Listen to what God says about himself when he's describe, describing himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. Moses says, who are you? Tell me who you are. And so God passes before him, and this is what God declares of himself. He says, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's God. 
And the psalmist that's writing this knows that's the one he's calling out to. He's calling out to a compassionate God. So often we have this picture of God. That God is sitting up in heaven and He's looking down on us with His scowl on His face. And a magnifying glass in one hand and a stapler and those sin tags in the other. And He's just waiting to go, oh, there's one. There's one for you. There's one for you. I am done with you. Boom. Lightning bolt right here. And we get that picture. We've all been told that that's the way God is. He's just up there waiting to strike us dead. I can't tell you how many times over the years I'll have a couple come in for premarital counseling. They don't go to church anywhere or anything. And it's always the guy that does this. They'll come through the doors and I'll come out of the office to meet him. And the guy will walk in and he'll go like this. Wow. I just knew lightning would strike me as soon as I came in here. And it's like, Dude, I've heard that like 4,000 times over the last 20 years, and it's not funny anymore. But that's the mentality people have. And it's not a biblical mentality. The biblical understanding of God is that God doesn't want to condemn you. God wants to forgive you. That's what God wants more than anything else, is to deal with your sin and forgive you. That's what He's always wanted. And He just wants us to come before Him and live there. Knowing He wants to forgive us. Laying ourselves at His feet saying, God, I can't do anything about this, but would you please do something? I don't want to spend eternity in this darkness separated from you. I want to live in the light. And God says, that's what I've always wanted, is for you to live in the light. In fact, just to kind of let you know how much God has always wanted to us to live in the light. Uh, well, actually, let's, let's finish the psalm here. The psalmist ends with, with a prayer. He says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with Him is full redemption. He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Here, again, the NIV doesn't translate the definite article in verse 7 because it literally says, For with the Lord is the unfailing love. And I think that's important for us to grasp in our world of broken marriages and broken relationships and conditional love to understand that God's love is unfailing love. And not only that, but with Him there is full redemption. The psalmist understands that God is going to redeem Israel. He wants to redeem you. He wants to remove all of your sin. He wants to, to remove everything that separates you from God and keeps you in the depths. And He wants to bring you light. In fact, I want you to turn with me over into John chapter 1. We are studying... John's Gospel in our Sunday morning Bible class. would love to have all of you show up. It's a great class. We've had a lot of great discussions. And we're learning a lot of great things. But John chapter 1, page 750 in your pew Bible. To show how much God doesn't want you to stay in the depths. Remember the song begins, out of the depths, out of the deep. And where it's going to end is in light because God wants to redeem His people. And that all comes into play right here. John chapter 1 that says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through Him all things were made. Nothing uh, Without Him nothing had, was made that has been made. In Him was the life, was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. John came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. John himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light, that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. 
The light came to that which was his own. Jesus came to the Jews, but his own did not receive him. And yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right or the power or the authority to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and lived a while, for a while among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And now turn over about seven pages, 757, to John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus is speaking and He says to the people, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never live in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, God always wanted to forgive. Go back to, to, to your dream, back into your dream realm. You see that you're covered with sin, and the voice comes to you and says, Go, he wants you to stand before him. And so you begin walking that way. And you're looking down, and it's like this stuff is just, it's everywhere. You know it's everywhere. And not only do you know it's everywhere, but you start remembering the sins in your life. All the days that you lived without ever even giving a thought to God. All of the days you spent in your life rejecting His Son. Again, all the lustful thoughts, the wicked thoughts, the deceit, the lies, the selfishness, the greed. Every time you spoke bad about someone, and the more you think about that, the more sick to your stomach you get. To the point where you can't even hold your head up and look at him because you were just so ashamed. And you keep going and the burden of this sin just keeps wearing you down more and more until you get to a point where you just actually, you just get out on your hands and knees and you just throw up. I'm not going to do that to demonstrate. But you just, you're so overcome with the grief and the pain and everything that you just throw up. And then you try to get back up and you go a few more steps and it's just so overwhelming that finally you just lay down and you just cry and you just sob. And you just plead, forgive me, have mercy on me, forgive me. And then in the midst of your tears, you notice that there's a light. And you look up and you see that not only is there a light, but the light is coming toward you. And out of that light, there's, there's something coming and you realize it's a hand. But it's not a finger pointing at you. Wanting to condemn you for everything. It's not a fist ready to just smite you. But it's a hand reaching out. Pleading with you to take this hand. And you reach up in your tears and in your sorrow and in your shame. And you reach up and, and you reach your hand out. And you can't bring yourself to touch that hand. And so the hand reaches out and takes yours. And immediately, all of that falls away and is no more. Out of the depths I cry to you, God will redeem Israel of all her sins. The psalm begins with this, and I'm going to change the wording a little bit. Oh, church, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is the unfailing love. And with Him is full redemption. He Himself will redeem you from all of your sins. I, I don't know where you are this morning. You may be in the depths. You may... Be in that place where you feel that your sin is so overwhelming that there is no way you can even stand in the presence of God. 
And I want to tell you, that little pug that you're feeling this morning, that's him calling out. And say, I don't want to continue. I want to forgive you. Come to me. Ask for mercy. And I'll give If that's what you need this morning, Jim's got a song picked out for us. We're all going to stand. We're going to sing it. If you need to come forward and ask for his mercy this morning, please do so while we stand and sing this song.